Today, I wanted to challenge myself to see how quickly I could build an entire droid. I decided on making an ID-10 Seeker droid. It's one of those projects that's been on my list for quite some time, and it's something I'll hopefully manage to finish within a few days. Started off by slicing all of the pieces to get them printing, any of the larger body pieces I used an FDM printer for, and to hopefully save myself a lot of time and sanding, I decided to print all of the leg parts in resin. For all of the body pieces, I wanted to try printing them at a 0.12 layer height to see how much time that would save me during post-processing. So all of these parts are taking about twice as long to print, but even then all of the build plates of pieces came out to just over a day of printing, even less if you choose to use multiple printers. As usual, I used ABS for my parts thanks to its post-processing benefits, which you will see firsthand in a bit. These pieces were all turning out great, and before I knew it, I had an entire droid printed and ready for the next step. Support removal. There really wasn't too many supports needed on these pieces, so it was mostly me just removing all of the brims that I like to put on parts when I'm printing with ABS. It's just a tiny bit of extra filament to ensure the parts don't warp at the edges, and all of it can get recycled back into ABS slurry to help with smoothing these pieces later on. This time I'm going to be using MEK though, or methyl ethyl ketone. It's kind of like acetone on steroids. I find it dissolves the ABS a lot faster, which means it's smoothing out the layer lines a lot faster. And I'm quite literally just slathering this MEK all over these pieces using a brush. I know there are always comments about like, why don't you just do acetone vapor smoothing or something like that? It is just so much easier and more convenient to slap it on with a brush. It also gives you the control to go back over the areas that need a bit more work, like for instance, a lot of these parts have more of a curved surface, so the top surfaces and the tops of the domes need a lot more work than the sides of these parts do. And that is why you see me sort of scrubbing over the same areas with a brush, because that is how you end up smoothing it out. Just applying the liquid will start to sort of melt everything together, but rubbing over the areas using the brush is what really makes all of those lines disappear. And this was also about the time that my long-eared apprentice decided to join me. He likes hopping on to different projects that interest him. <laughs> but anyway, once the MEK has sort of evaporated and everything has set up, we can start with our first round of sanding, of course using the foot sander. Did you think I would ever work on a droid without using this tool? Absolutely not. ABS's ease of sandability is also one of my largest reasons for using this material for all of my prop projects, and applying the MEK or acetone to the surface doesn't affect its sandability at all. It still seems to sand just as easily, except I've already done an entire round of smoothing before I've even gotten to the sanding process. Which means just after one round of sanding, my parts end up looking something like this. Already the layer lines are basically non-existent, so hopefully we won't have to do a whole lot more work on these parts after a couple of rounds of filler primer. Even if you don't have the ability to use ABS at the moment, doing a really good first sand and then some rounds of filler primer will still give you a really good result. I'm sure using a smaller layer height on these parts also helped out. This is about the time I started to do a whole lot of back and forth to try and be more efficient, so I only sanded the largest of the body parts so that I could get that first round of filler primer on them, and then while that was drawing, I went back and sanded all of the other body parts to then get the first round of filler primer on those. Now, realistically, I don't necessarily need to be in a rush building this droid, but every once in a while, I just like trying to do somewhat of like a build drill because it means if there's ever a project that I legitimately need to get done on a super tight time crunch, then I know how to be really efficient with my building process. But yeah, obviously just enjoy the process of working on your droids at whatever speed that might be. But if you do figure out how to be more efficient, it does mean you have more time to build more droids in the future, so you know, something to think about. The final FDM part that I needed for this droid was the base. I decided to design my own, which I will link somewhere in the description box if you want this for your own Seeker droid. So I got that designed and then printed also in ABS, which meant I could do my usual MEK maneuver to smooth all of the layers out. I wasn't entirely sure how I wanted this painted and I figured I probably did want to paint it. So that is why I did the whole sanding process on this as well. But this obviously could be printed in a particular filament that you like the color 
color of to leave as is. And of course did a couple of rounds of filler primer on this base too. And it did mean while I was working on this base, it gave the filler primer layers on all of the droid parts time to dry and set. And this is what they were looking like. Looked really clean as is. So I wanted to sand them with a bit of a finer sandpaper because I figured this was probably going to be the only filler primer that actually goes on these parts. Once I had everything sanded down, I thought it would probably be a good idea to attach the eye parts onto these larger body pieces. Because all of these parts were smaller, I did resin print them, so they really didn't need any post-processing, which meant I could just attach them to the body and then continue on the painting process from there. Here's what the upper part of the droid's body was looking like with all of the eyes attached. Thankfully, the lower half of the body only had one eye piece to add. The next step I decided to take for these parts was to prime everything in this black primer. I want to be doing real paint chipping on all of these pieces, so they will be getting sprayed silver eventually, but starting off with a black base always looks nice. While I was waiting for the black paint to dry on everything, I did go ahead and do a round of filler primer on all of the leg pieces. They were resin, so they looked pretty great as is, but the filler primer was just going to help fill in any small imperfections and also help with paint adhering to these parts later. But then it was on to spraying everything silver. This was my choice of silver this time around. I am unbelievably picky when it comes to metallic paint because the majority, especially spray paints, tend to have a lot of glitter in them and they don't necessarily come across as a true metal. But this is one of the few that really doesn't. And you can see here just how great of like a slightly chrome effect it has. It's also a significantly cheaper spray paint compared to my other choice of silver, which is an automotive paint and like twice the price for half of the paint. So I'm a big fan of this one. Absolutely everything got sprayed with that silver with the exception of the base. And for that, I did decide to bust out some automotive paint. This was not the silver that I was referring to this was left over from, I believe, IG-12, but I'm not entirely sure. And I thought that having this base being a slightly darker gunmetal color would complement the droid nicely. And then it was on to the actual paint chipping using some masking fluid. To apply this, I like using a crumpled up ball of tin foil or even a ball of painter's tape. There are proper masking fluid application tools and sometimes I'll even put it in a fine tipped bottle, but the crumpled up tin foil or tape just gives you such a nice natural effect, especially when you are looking at paint chipping on a prop. It'll give you a lot of interesting organic shapes and you can always reform the ball to be a bit of a different shape especially with tin foil, it'll really only hit the high points, which is probably where you want the paint chipping to be the most. It's just a nice quick and most of the time foolproof way to apply your masking fluid for paint chipping. And I repeated this step for any of the pieces that I wanted there to be paint chipping on. Once the masking fluid had dried, we can start the painting process. Now, originally I was considering doing a custom color scheme, but the more that I saw this Battlefront color combination, I just knew that this had to be the one. I don't currently have any yellow droids and I don't plan to be making any particular yellow droid. So I knew this was going to be a really interesting addition to my collection. So I started off by spraying any of the applicable parts in my chosen gray color. And then it was on to this absolutely incredible shock yellow Montana color. Yellow is just such a hard color to paint and this paint is absolutely gorgeous. I know this ends up being the color choice for a lot of people for command battle droids, so if you have one of those and have some yellow left over, then this might be an interesting droid choice for you as well. But once I finished the yellow, that was it for the spray painting that I needed to do. I decided that I also wanted there to be some paint chipping on the leg pieces, so I used the same method with the masking fluid and the tinfoil ball for all of those parts. And once the masking fluid had dried, I used a combination of magnesium and burnt iron through my airbrush to paint everything. And both of these are darker silver gunmetal colors. I tried the magnesium on its own and it didn't quite look dark enough for my liking. So that is why I used a like 50-50 mix of the two. And of course applied that to all of the leg parts, which I know a lot of people are going to say is excessive. I really just wanted these to have authentic paint chipping, which does mean you need the silver underneath all of the color so that it appears underneath the paint over top. But you know, paint your droid however you like. There's nothing wrong with adding silver to the 
the edges afterwards instead of doing it this method. Now I apparently completely neglected to film the part where I masked off a couple of these leg pieces so that I could spray some detailed areas on them using that shock yellow spray paint, but here's what that was looking like. The tape did annoyingly remove a bit more than the masking fluid would have allowed, so I did fix that later on. I also sprayed these other leg parts in a gloss black, and then again it had that yellow stripe that I masked off for, but then it was just having to remove all of the masking fluid on these parts. You can just kind of rub it off, but a lot of the time I will use this metal sponge because it will also add some additional scratches and just some nice chipping to the parts. And I of course had to repeat that for all of the leg pieces, which I'm sure you've noticed in this video, there's not exactly a lack of individual leg parts for this droid. I also used the same method to remove all of the masking fluid from the droid body parts as well. And this is also where the metal sponge becomes a really useful tool, especially with the spray paint, because it tends to be a lot thicker, so sometimes it's really hard to figure out where the masking fluid is and to even just chip it off with your fingers. But once I had all of the masking fluid removed, there was a bit of hand painting that I wanted to do on a couple of parts using this gloss black paint. It was just going to be a more pleasant experience for me to hand paint this than trying to mask these areas off and paint them with an airbrush or something. And that was it for the painting, which means we can start the assembly process. Start off by gluing the two top parts of the droid together and then started working on the main body. There are some dowels that you put into holes on the bottom section of the main body piece. Added some glue onto all of that and then added the ring piece. And then it was just the bottom part of the main body onto those same dowels. There's also a second bottom ring that goes onto this bottom piece with its own dowels. I let the glue set for a bit and then flipped it over so that we can start adding the small magnets into these holes on the top of the body. This is so that the very top section of this droid is removable so that you can access the inside for any possible maintenance for the legs and also the LEDs we're going to be adding into the eyes. Just make sure you've double checked the polarity of all of the magnets so that they will actually attach properly later. Next, I decided to start assembling all of these leg parts together. These use a couple of different sizes of M6 furniture bolts, which makes the legs fully articulating and completely poseable, which is really cool. Once I had all four of the legs assembled, it was on to even more weathering. The paint chipping on its own does look great, but I do find it to be maybe a bit unrealistic if it isn't combined with some darker areas that look like like dirt and debris have started to build up. This time around, I used a combination of some different acrylic paint colors and just applied this using a brush and then sort of wiped it off, blotted it using a paper towel. This just gave me the perfect amount of control for this project so that I could really only build up those darker areas in the deeper crevices where I wanted the paint to be. I also made sure to spend a decent amount of time on the actual hardware since it was looking pretty pristine compared to the rest of the legs. Just needed to tone down that silver a little bit. I also did a bit of the same weathering process on the main body. Again, mostly just focusing on the crevices and deeper recesses of the droid. There is obviously paint chipping all over this droid, but overall it's not a very dirty droid in appearance. It's really just those deeper recesses that need a little bit of darkness to just really sell the whole look. After the weathering, it was on to some final touches, starting with adding some LED lights. Listen, I am not into fancy electronics, so this was me just soldering some LEDs together onto a battery pack to power them. They're a bunch of three volt diodes, so I just used a coin battery, which has the ability to use a very convenient battery pack that already has an on and off switch on it. So I did a four set of red LEDs and a five set of white LEDs. Thankfully, the majority of these eye sections had like the perfect five millimeter hole that I could just add some hot glue to the diode and then just sort of stick it in to keep it in place. And here is what that was looking like with all of the white LEDs installed. These lenses were all all some small glass cobochons, but there are a group of printable lenses which I did decide to use. I printed them in some clear resin, but as you can see, once you have them all cleaned off and cured, they don't end up being that translucent. So to improve this, I'm going to be adding some gloss varnish to both sides of the lenses. You can also sand these and buff these to be even more transparent, but even just adding a couple of rounds of gloss varnish to either side of the lens really improves the translucency of these pieces. 
pieces. I didn't spend as much time on these parts as I typically maybe would because a lot of them I knew I was going to end up tinting with some spray on headlight tint. But now it's time to start adding all of these final eye pieces to the main body. Starting with this inner eye section, this also had its own lens, although this one I did leave clear. There's also this ring that sort of snaps in in between the inner and outer eye pieces. And then the last step was just gluing in all of the different lenses. I used some really thin super glue for this so that I could use the tip attachment to get the glue exactly where I wanted it. And even though all of these lenses did have quite a dark tint to them, you can see that the red LED looks really great through them still. And then it was on to final assembly, starting with adding all of the legs to the body. I kept the lower body section separate so that I could more easily show you how these legs go on. So each one goes in a hole and then there is this like T-shaped pin that slides into a hole and sort of locks them in place, but it still means that the legs are fully rotatable within the body. The fifth hole is for the stand piece to go into. So it goes into this lower body section the same way that the legs do. You can also lock it into place if you want, and then that piece can go into a pole. I decided to use an acrylic pole for this so that it really makes it look like this droid is floating. The stand piece that's attached to the droid just sits on top of the pole. And from there, the main body sort of sits on top of this lower body section, but there are also a couple of T-pins to lock it in place. Again, the pins mean that this middle body section is fully rotatable and also a little articulating front to back. And then it's just sitting the top part onto those magnets. And here is my finished Seeker droid. I did manage to pull this off in 72 hours. It was like a day and a half of post-processing and priming and a day and a half of painting and final touches. But as I mentioned earlier, the most important thing is that you're enjoying the process of building your droids. It is cool to know that this could possibly be a weekend project for some people or even just over a couple of weekends. So I highly recommend looking at adding a Seeker droid to your collection because this was a really fun build, not a huge time sink, and also not too bad material wise. If I'd printed everything in filament, not including the base, I bet it would have only taken about half a kilogram of filament. But that is everything. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in my next video.